Welcome back to the ITU headquarters here in Geneva, which is of course hosting the AI for Good Global Summit. And I'm really pleased to have a man with me now who just gave a speech to all the delegates here. His name is Salil Shetty, Secretary General of Amnesty International. I guess it's been a pretty busy few weeks for you recently, but let's talk just about AI. I understand how AI can help big business, I can understand how it helps with medical care, I can understand how it helps education. I haven't worked out yet really how it helps with human rights. Tell me about that. It's early days, I mean for AI in general and AI for human rights is very, very early days. But you know, potentially something as basic as providing legal services, as you know legal aid is not available in far-flung places, certainly for poorer communities it's almost inaccessible and not having lawyers absolutely you know it really makes the criminal justice system not function properly for the poor. So you can think of legal services as a very concrete thing but you, know, you could think of it when we think about human rights often we only think about civil and political rights but economic social rights include health, education, water so the applicability of AI for making education accessible, making health accessible and affordable is phenomenal. But I must say I'm here more to actually talk about the converse, which is the risks which we have to be very conscious of in relation to an unbridled, unregulated artificial intelligence system coming into play, which could potentially endanger human rights. In what sense that big data get, ends up in the wrong hands, authoritarian leaders? The three dimensions which we are concerned about. One is what does this do in terms of reinforcing existing prejudices and biases and sort of it could become a new way of discriminating against people who are already suffering from discrimination. Secondly, there's a real issue about the transparency and the lack of transparency. Uh, and the third is the issue of employment and what it could potentially do to increasing inequality. Um, and I could tell you briefly about each of these. So if you take the inequality issue, all the studies from World Bank, etc. are showing that if you bring in artificial intelligence and robots to replace jobs, automation could mean job losses of up to 87% in a place like Ethiopia, 60% plus in a country like mine, India or Nigeria. Even the OECD average is above 50%. So I'm not suggesting that we should be Luddite and say we don't need new technology, but we have to be very conscious that it does displace people from jobs. So we have to you know, bring in uh, mitigation uh, kind of plans. How do you address this? On the issue of discrimination, this is real, it's already happening because you have AI powered systems, for example, now being used in the US uh, for parole and sentencing in several US states. And already studies are showing that, you know, the, you use an algorithm using historical data and already discriminates against black people. So they're seen as, you know, black males are the ones who are mostly in jails in the US. In fact, also in Brazil, for example. And so you use an algorithm based on historical data, you can be sure that there are high risk scores for black people. And it's the whole predictive policing, for example, uh, takes you towards, you know, what's the person's family name, what's their neighborhood. So this is starting to happen in the UK and US and clear patterns. So there's a real kind of concern there. And I think the, on, the, on the other side, the transparency side, you know, we don't really know who's in charge here. You know? And so if, uh, for example, if for military and policing, if you start using killer robots, um, who's accountable for that? You know, 19 states have already called for a complete ban on killer robots, Chile, Mexico, Ghana. So you need accountability, you need systems in place. So Amnesty International's call here today is that we are at a fork in the road. You know, you could have a train which is hurtling down a track at breakneck speed without even a driver. Forget about being asleep at the wheel. You actually don't even have a driver. So we have to bring this thing into a place where it could be very beneficial. Uh, you know, you could have an AI system which actually counters historical biases, which creates jobs, which stops discrimination and which increases transparency. It's possible. But only if you have a designed system based on human rights principles and not flying blind. Yeah, I would have thought with AI, you could actually at the same time as the bad guys, I guess, amass information on people who are violating human rights and then you can almost name and shame better that way. You could, but you know, where is the, I mean, who is doing that work? You know, the, the corporations, the big corporations are investing. 
are figuring out how to make the most money out of it, right? So there is no public engagement in this process. I think a lot of the technologists and the engineers who are working on this would be very up for that. But the people who are putting the money behind it are not looking for public good as an objective. So, Tell me again about how legal aid could be useful through AI in far-flung places. I mean, it's amazing, you know, because right now if you, for example, I'll give you the example in India, for example, yeah. So, almost half the prison population in India are people who are what in India we call under trials, which means that these are people who are in detention without trial. They're just sitting there and they should be able to get a bail and get out of jail. So you can imagine if they had legal support to make sure that they can actually get out of jail because they can't afford to pay the bail. But technically, legally in India, they're supposed to be released. They've already served more than half the term of what they should have served for stealing a loaf of bread, you know, for very minor crimes. Um, so if legal support is available, these people would be free. And these are, the biases are such that normally the people who are in jail as so-called under trials typically would be lower caste people, poorer people, Muslims, you know, like there's a clear bias in the way people end up in jail. But how does AI provide the legal aid? Well, I mean, if it's a public good, if you have an AI system which allows ordinary people to access it, I'm not saying it's there today, but I'm saying if, if governments work with technology companies and civil society organizations to make this available, there's amazing things that could be done with AI. Lastly, yeah, you've got big business here, you've got researchers, you've got startups, the whole works. At the end of the three days, what do you want to come out of this? So our call is that, you know, we are at a kind of fork in the road. You could get AI for good or you could get AI for good for a few people. So the question is, how do we move to AI for good for all and not some? And for that, we don't have, a, you know, if you start an intergovernmental negotiation process of the UN in today's climate, I'm using the word advisedly, when the US is pulling out of the climate agreement, you're not going to get any solution to this. So it has to be a fast-tracked way in which a multi-stakeholder process is started. So we need something like a working group coming out of this meeting of key people who can move this you know, in a positive way because we want to encourage innovation, we want to get the technologies excited to do the right stuff, but someone's got to be guiding them on what the right stuff is. Salil Shetty, that was the head of Amnesty International talking to me, very exciting, very interesting what he has to say about the fork in the road, about AI in the future. Thanks again for talking Thank to you. us.